Welcome back to my series of videos on mathematics for economists. In this video, I'm going to go through three examples for dynamic optimization in continuous time, often also referred to as optimal control. These three examples are going to be of increasingly involved structure, and my aim with this video is to showcase precisely the structure in the hope that if you are um, uh, setting out to solve a given problem uh, that you can recognize where to locate your problem uh, in this structure and then find the right tools to solve it. So the tools that I'm going to use and that I'm not going to further explain in this video are how to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a given matrix and I'm going to use solution methods for second-order differential equations. Uh, scalar where I'm going to use the characteristic polynomial. And I'm also going to look at two by two systems of first order differential equations, which can be transformed to scalar second order differential equations uh, or uh, solved by a way of, uh, of eigenvalues and eigenvectors again. So these things I'm going to use here and I'm not going to further explain them because they are not central to this video. Central here is again, the structure that emerges when solving these optimal control problems. To fix notation, I have written down here the maximum principle, which is the, the workhorse method that I'm going to apply to tackle these three examples. So what we're having is a, a, an object we want to maximize with respect to a function, u. I have suppressed the dependence of the function on its argument here, but the argument is time. Q is a function of time. It's often referred to as the control. This is what we can choose. Um, then the objective integrand here depends on this chosen function, and we want to uh, maximize the integral over this objective integrand on the interval 0 to capital T. At any given point in time, you can take any real values. So I'm not looking at a restricted control region as it's referred to. So the control region here is just the entire real line. One can look at restrictions here, but we're not doing this in this video. X is also a function of time. It's a state that depends by way of a differential equation, first order, on our chosen control function and on the state itself and on time many different configurations are imaginable here i'm going to pick some examples we have an initial condition for this differential equation so that x in the initial point in time just has to hit a certain value and i'm here writing that the value of the state at the terminal time is free, by which I mean that x of capital T can be, again, any real number. Uh, I am not requiring that we hit a specific value. Um, there's no terminal condition. I'm not requiring that we're above or below a certain th threshold. All these things can be considered, um, and they give rise to different, uh, what's referred to as transversality conditions. But here, in all of our three examples, um, the terminal value will be free, can take any real value. And this means, this is a specific transversality condition, that the adjoint function, which I'm going to uh, get to in a moment, has to be zero at the terminal point in time. We're then constructing our Hamiltonian function, which is an auxiliary function, very much in the spirit of the Lagrangian auxiliary function that I have been working with in my videos on examples for optimization subject to constraints given by equalities or by inequalities, which I'm going to link in the description of the video because I'm going to come back to the similarities here throughout this video. So the Hamiltonian function is defined as the objective integrand plus the adjoint function times what's on the right-hand side of this differential equation here. Um, 
The maximum principle states the first order conditions, necessary conditions for optimality for pairs u and x, u chosen, x then implied by the differential equation. And uh, these first order conditions are that we want to maximize the Hamiltonian with respect to u, for which we first find a critical point with respect to u, where the partial derivative uh, of h with respect to u is equal to zero. Then there is a differential equation for the adjoint function, um, that the derivative of the adjoint with respect to time, note that I'm using the dot notation here, um, that the derivative with respect to time is equal to the negative partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the state variable x. Well, and then there's the transversality condition that I already referred to. We can also talk about um, sufficient conditions here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, this is the only place where, where I mentioned this, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk much about that. Um, but if the, uh, uh, if the if the Hamiltonian function, for example, is concave in the arguments x and u, uh, then we know that uh, a pair x and u that satisfies the first order conditions is already optimal. And then there are generalizations of that. But again, that let that not be the subject of this video. Uh, it will be such that in our examples, the Hamiltonian is always going to be concave in this shape, and so we don't have to further worry about that. All right, uh, without further ado, I'm going to get into the examples, and I'm starting with the simplest one. So we have, a, we want to maximize with respect to u again, and u is in an unconstrained control region, the integral from 0 to t over the integrand minus ax minus u square. And then we have the differential equation that x dot is equal to u with an initial condition. And again, Consider the case where the adjoint function must be zero on the end, or in other words, there is no constraint on the terminal point of the state. Well, then formulating our Hamiltonian, this is minus ax minus u squared plus pu. So you can see that this is concave in u, linear in x, so together concave in x and u. Um, maximum principle, first condition, we take the derivative of the Hamiltonian, set it equal to zero. What's the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to u? It's minus 2u plus p equal to zero. And we see that uh, when, as soon as we have an adjoint function, we also have the optimal control because it's given as p half. So then the differential equation for the adjoint function is that the derivative with respect to time is equal to the negative derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. So this is minus parentheses minus a. I like to write this minus minus. Of course, one could do this uh, just, uh, one could just skip this, but that's a uh, very popular source of errors, so I like to write it all out. Um, so p is given as a times t plus c. Now I'm just integrating over uh, p prec here, so I'm integrating with respect to time. This gives me this is a constant, so this gives me just a t plus a plus an integration constant, and then I use the now this is a terminal condition for the adjoint function, so I use the transversality condition to find the value of c. So this is a times capital T plus c is supposed to be zero. Um, and so we get that c is negative 
a t and we can write p of t as a times time minus terminal of time. So we can write the optimal control function as I'm going to write it as minus a half, so I can write capital T minus T, then we get uh, a positive time variable, so to say. And with this value of u and of p, we can now also solve our differential equation for x. x, x dot was uh, given by u, and this is minus a half t minus t, as we just found. And so we integrate one more time and get the state variable x as minus a half capital T. This is just a number, right? So this is a constant we integrate times time plus um, and then min minus minus a plus a half t and integrated with respect to time gives a divided by four t squared and then we uh, get an integration constant and this integration constant must be such that the initial condition here is satisfied and so we can just add x naught right away yeah so now we have a solution we have uh, we have u here and we have x here and this pair satisfies the first order conditions. And as I mentioned, it also satisfies uh, sufficient conditions. So this is an optimal pair. Now, this is just a soft example. Uh, as I promised, I want to show structure. So I'm going to write a system of first order differential equations here, which we did not use for anything. And it's a bit boring in this case, but we're going to come back to this when we then engage more complicated problems. Uh, so note that you can write the differential equations that we just solved one after the other also as a system where you specify a system for X and for P for the state and for the adjoint function. And here the, um, uh, the differential equation for the state says that the that x dot is p half, right? This is what we found here in the first um, condition of the maximum principle. So I, I noted that here. Um, p dot does not depend on on, on x or on p at all, it's just a constant. So I'm adding a constant vector here. So this shows you that that this you can write it as a system, all right, but it's not terribly interesting because uh, you can you can just solve for p because it's just given by by a constant, or the derivative is just given by a constant, and then with that you can just go into x and, and integrate that to find a solution, and that's that. All right, so second example. That was the first. Now the second example. Again, we maximize with respect to u, which comes from an unconstrained control region, integral 0 to t over minus ax squared plus x minus u square dt such that x dot is u minus b x. Initial condition and x in the terminal point in time is free, so the adjoint at terminal time needs to be zero. We formulate the Hamiltonian object integrand minus ax squared 
plus x minus u squared plus the joint function p times the g function on the right hand side of the differential equation u minus bx. All right. We differentiate the Hamiltonian with respect to u and we get minus 2au plus p equal to 0 and this gives us u as p half once again. The differential equation for the adjoint function p dot negative partial derivative of Hamiltonian with respect to the state which is minus uh, with respect to the state minus 2a x um, plus 1 minus p times b so 2a x minus 1 plus p b now we can see that a system of first order differential equations for x and p arises and this time it's not trivial so we can write x dot s oh, i'll just collect the the differential equations here again u minus bx now we found what u is so i write first um, minus b x plus u is p half from here right? and then p dot is 2 a x plus b times p minus 1 so we can write the system x dot p dot in a vector is and we want to make it dependent then or we want to multiply a matrix rather uh, with the vector x and p mm, so what are the entries of this matrix minus b one half two a and b this is going to give us the homogeneous term and then we have an inhomogeneous part here the minus one uh, so there's nothing for x but there's a minus one for p right so this is a system of first order differential equations that we can solve um, first i'm going to this is an inhomogeneous equation so the first thing i do is i transform it to a homogeneous equation and I do this by finding what economists like to call the steady state. So I look at the points x and p, so the pair x and p, for which there is no change in x and p. That's why it's called steady state. So this is this matrix. Let me call this matrix capital A. So I have this A times a certain set of values that I'm after x star p star plus this constant vector which I call c right so okay so essentially the the system of equations I have to solve now and this is just a simple system of equations as in linear algebra is a times a vector plus c equal to zero all right for that I just employ the uh, the inverse of a and I find that this is given by 1 over a plus b square times minus b 1 half 2a and b so this is the matrix itself this I found by taking the reciprocal of the determinant and multiplying it, mul mul multiplying by the educate of a. So here the educate of a is actually just is just minus a 
and so I get the um, I divide by the negative determinant and then just multiply by the by the matrix itself. Okay, um, with this I can calculate a minus a inverse times c. That's the factor I'm interested in. Right? From this equation here. And this is given as um, so minus one over a plus b square times the matrix itself b one half two a sorry minus b two uh, a b and then multiplied by the vector zero and minus one so these two cancel. And I get 1 over 2a plus 2b square and b over a plus b square. These are my two steady state values for x and for p. Now, with these steady state uh, values, I can look at the transformation um, x minus x star so i look at the distance of x from its steady state value and i look at the distance of p from its steady state value and i specify the differential equation or the system of differential equations rather for these distances from the steady state uh, then i get The homogeneous part of the equation. Yeah, and um, since uh, 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 these guys here are just constants, the derivative with uh, with respect to time of those is equal to zero, and therefore this is just x dot and p dot. Okay, so then I refer to, as I said, the solution theory of second order differential equations and systems of first order differential equations uh, that I can solve this by way of finding the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, of course, I can also quickly show it. So if you have a system uh, so, so let's just this is a vector yeah uh, this is this is two by one um, this a times x this is the structure of the problem at hand i assume that x has the solution structure v times e to the lambda t um, all right then if that is true x dot is then lambda times v times e to the lambda t, lambda being a scalar, and then we get lambda v e to the lambda t is equal to a x is by solution assumption equal to a v e to the lambda t. Multiply the whole thing by e to the minus lambda t and you get lambda v equal to a v. This is of course the eigenvalue equation, right? So this is why we can solve these kind of systems with uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. All right, so we find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix here. And you can convince yourself that the first eigenvalue is the square root of a plus b squared with associated eigenvector one and two times a plus b squared plus two square root of a plus b squared plus two b and the second eigenvalue is minus a plus b squared with associated eigenvalue minus one and two square root of a plus b squared plus no sorry not plus minus two minus Okay, then 
by way of our solution assumption, we can write the solution for the vector x and p as functions of time as some constant that we have to find by using the initial condition for x and the terminal condition for p times first eigenvector e to the lambda 1 first eigenvector eigenvalue times t so e to the lambda 1 t is a scalar b1 is a vector 2 by 1 a is just a is just a number ah a that's not that's not terribly pretty right because i used capital a for the matrix so that's not what we're going to do we're going to call this something else uh, we're going to call this uh, what c1 that's just a scalar plus another scalar constant to be determined by initial and terminal conditions second eigenvector e to the second eigenvalue times t all right um, yeah so we can also write it out let's write it out so this is uh, this is c1 times one first entry in the eigenvector times e to the uh, lambda one square root of a plus b square times t plus c2 e to the minus square root of a plus b square times t and here below we get these slightly more fourth coefficients but all right um, two square root of a plus b square plus two b e to the well of course we also get the get the the constant thank you so c1 e to the a plus b square t plus c2 2 square root of a plus b square minus 2b e to the minus square root of a plus b square t so now how do we find these uh, uh, coefficients c1 and c2 as i said uh, this requires the initial condition on x and the terminal condition on p also called the transversality condition so we can write that at x equal to zero uh, of course we have um, uh, c1 times the first entry in the vector um, and then uh, C1 um, plus C2. Well, that's the second entry in the vector. I should have given this the 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 name minus. It doesn't in the end really matter because of course we can choose the the the, the convention of the sign for C1 and C2 as we like. But I'm going to correct this here so that you have that you don't get confused about the about the pattern matching here. Um, so I'm going to call this thing here call this thing minus and then also that one for minus all right um, equal to x naught and uh, p of capital T well now I have to write these these involve coefficients here but I'm going to make my life a bit easier so I'm going to call these guys here I'm going to call these guys what I'm going to call them 
d1 of t and d2 of t. Because then I can write um, d1 of capital T here times c1 plus d2 of capital T here times c2. And that must be equal to zero, right? So here I've used uh, initial and terminal conditions. And that, well, then I can solve this system of equations. This now again is a simple static system of equations as in, as in uh, linear algebra for C1 and C2. Okay, but to, to take a step back so that we can uh, uh, hopefully see the forest for the trees, because that's of course always my intention with these uh, videos. Uh, here we have a system of first order, I'm going to go all the way up here, we have a system of first order uh, differential equations that emerges for the state and for the uh, for the adjoint function. And here, the first order conditions from the maximum principle uh, give us a system of equations where we have mutual dependence of x and p. So this is a non-trivial system of equations. So we have to um, uh, we have to solve it as a system. We cannot, as we did in the first example, first solve the one equation and, and thereafter the other, uh, because one of the two is independent of the other. That's not the situation here. They are mutually dependent. Uh, they also have an inhomogeneous term that I need to take care of first. So, so I have to uh, uh, flap my wings here a bit in order to solve the system of equations. And uh, 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 this is what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm doing here. And I'm ending up uh, from the theory of uh, second order differential equations or system of first order differential equations with this solution form for uh, the system of the state and of the adjoint. But once I have that, then, then I have a, a solution for P, I can go back and specify my optimal uh, control just as one half of P. Yeah, I'm not going to write this now down, uh, just multiplying um, multiplying this whole thing here just by one half. But you see it's very easy because there are actually coefficients two and two and two and two here. So they're just going to vanish other than otherwise it's going to look like this. All right. So that was the second example. And you can see it's a bit more involved than the first because the first was a, was a let me call it a boring system of equations because I first could solve for P and then for X. All right, three, the third example. Now, I'm looking at the following problem. I want to maximize with respect to u, which is in an unconstrained control region, the integral from zero to t over the function minus a x squared, or of the function is probably the better way of calling it, uh, the integral of the function. And now I have um, one of those, um, discount factors in the integrand, e to the minus rt. That is a structure that emerges in economics quite frequently. And the differential equation for x is given as bx plus u. Again, we have initial conditions. Um, this time I'm actually saying that x naught was one. And again, I'm looking at the case where x is not constrained in the terminal condition and I get uh, a zero terminal condition for the adjoint function. Okay, I'm also going to assume, and this is not really very material, it's just for convenience, that r square divided by four is bigger than rb minus a minus b square. This is only to avoid complex solutions here. Uh, they don't have to be avoided. One can deal with complex solutions. I just don't want to do it here in this video because it's going to uh, take, a, take some time 
that kind of distracts from the main point of this video. So therefore, I'm just uh, introducing this assumption here so that I'm only ending up with real solutions. All right, so I write down the Hamiltonian, object integrant minus a x squared minus u squared. And I have to be careful now to take this um, exponential function along plus p times bx plus u. Okay, and then I just go through the conditions of the maximum principle. The derivative with respect to u, well, that would be minus 2u e to the minus rt plus p equal to 0, from which I get that u is p half e to the rt. p dot is the negative derivative with respect to the state is the negative of uh, minus 2ax e to the minus rt plus pb. 2ax e to the minus rt minus pb. All right. So let's look at the differential equation for x again. Px plus u, u now found as p half e to the rt. So if now I write my system of equations for x and p, system of differential equations, I get B one half e to the RT two A E to the RT and minus B. So you see that the coefficient matrix structure here is not unlike what we looked at in the second example, but there are coefficients of time here in this matrix. If you have studied uh, systems of linear equations, uh, then you will know that you are not terribly fond of them. No, they're not impossible to solve, but uh, uh, there are further complications. So this is why I said that I'm going to use three examples of uh, increasing complexity or uh, complexity. I don't want to. Uh, cause any confusion here with respect to complex numbers so of of increasing complication because the complication that occurs here in this example is precisely this that the uh, coefficients in the matrix in the system of differential equations is time dependent which we did not have before uh, well, it turns out we can we can nevertheless uh, solve this so we're going to do this and uh, we do it by transforming this system of first order differential equations to scalar second order differential equations and i'm going to do this with uh, uh, with p first um, i'm also going to solve this third example in a moment by another method that avoids this but let's first do this standard approach from the standard formulation of the maximum principle. So from, um, from the equation for x, I can write p as 2 times e to the minus rt times x dot minus bx. Right? If that is true, I can take the derivative with respect to time and I get a product rule minus 2r e to the minus rt times x dot minus bx plus 2 e to the minus rt and now I have to take the derivative of this x dot dot minus bx dot 
so I can use my differential equation for um, for p and write p dot on the left hand side minus 2r e to the minus rt x dot minus bx plus 2 e to the minus rt x dot minus bx dot equal to 2ax e to the minus rt now i'm writing what's here on the on the right hand side minus p times b and i'm plugging in what i know is p so i get minus 2 b e to the minus rt x dot minus b x okay if you look at this equation now you see this is a second order differential equation for x and i have eliminated all terms involving p so all i need to do now this is this relation between first order systems of differential equations or rather systems of first order differential equations and scalar second order differential equations that i was referring to earlier uh, i've done it here in this example but of course you can also do it generally um other sort of no, no all, all that's that's left to do here so to speak uh, in order to solve for x in order to solve for x is to collect all the terms and uh, 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 and, and, and 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 just clean up right so you see if you look at this that you can multiply by one half e to the rt and you're going to get rid of all this two times e to the minus rt here first right so let's do that so we get uh, uh, r x dot minus b x um, plus x dot dot minus b x dot is equal to a x minus b x dot minus b x and now I sort according to differentiation order here. So beginning with x dot dot minus r x dot plus rb. These are the coefficients on x minus a on the right hand side minus b square from the right hand side there's a there's a minus minus here that becomes plus over to the left hand side becomes minus again times x equal to zero here i have a second order differential equation for x in standard form and i'm using this with the characteristic polynomial of this equation now i said i'm just going to use it without explaining it but um, this video is going to be long enough I can spend this 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 brief moment here so again we're assuming um, that the uh, solution is in no, uh, this should not be should not be an R in this case it should be it should be something else we're assuming that this is um, that this is an alpha alpha T if that's true then x dot is alpha e to the alpha t uh, x dot dot is alpha square e to the alpha t the differential equation becomes alpha square e to the alpha t minus r uh, e to the uh, r alpha e to the alpha t um, plus rb minus a minus b square e to the alpha t equal to 
0, I multiply through with e to the minus alpha t to get alpha square minus alpha minus r alpha, excuse me. For some reason, this r wants to run away from me. Minus r alpha uh, plus rb minus a minus b squared equal to 0. You see, this is just a second order equation in alpha. Right? So I can solve it just with the with the standard formulas here for solving or for finding the roots of a second order polynomial. So I get um, alpha 1 2 as minus minus r half r half so r half plus minus square root of r square quarter. The square root is not terribly pretty, allow me to make it a bit more recognizable, r square quarter, and then I subtract this rb minus a minus b squared term here. And now you can see, so, so in case this, uh, 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 this expression here and the square root would be negative, I would be faced with complex alpha 1 and alpha 2. I am not terribly keen on that at this point in time. Usually I actually am because I do like complex solutions. You get two for the price of one and you also get nice trigonometric functions that are going on. Uh, but I don't want to spend time on that right now. So uh, that's why I'm saying I'm not keen on them. And that's why I have assumed further up here that um, exactly this radicand, uh, what's in the square root here, is positive. So that I have just... Uh, two nice real numbers here, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And I can specify my solutions for, uh, for x. I can also, if I want to, I can also give them, give, introduce a bit of notation here. Call, let's call these guys capital R1 and capital R2. Um, and then specify my solutions xt so I get one solution of course but it consists of a linear combination of two linear linearly independent functions uh, this would be uh, now I, I need to I need two constants again and uh, I don't want to use I haven't used capital A and capital B here in this example yet, right? So I'm still free to use them because I did not call this matrix here capital R. So then I'm just going to take this freedom and call this capital A, but it's maybe still a bit confusing because I mean a scalar, okay? A is just a number, it's not a matrix here. A is just a number, I'll say it again. Uh, maybe I should also write it. Um, e to the first root here, uh, r1 plus r2 times t um, plus b, also scalar, uh, e to the r1 minus r2 times t. So um, then if, if, if that's true, then I can write uh, x dot of t as a um, r1 plus r2 e to the chain rule r1 plus r2 t plus b r1 minus r2 e to the r1 minus r2 t. And with that, I can write. So I, I I have the solution for x, right? So what I'm what I'm after now, the reason why I now took the, the derivative and where I'm going is that I also need to find u. It's always the pair x and u. Um, so I'm going after u, and because u is given in the um, in the differential equation, 
as x dot minus bx. I can isolate u. I can evaluate x dot minus bx. And that is going to give me um, that is going to give me a times r1 plus r2 minus b e to the r1 plus r2 t plus b r1 minus r2 minus b e to the r1 minus r2 t. And this is by way of the differential equation for x again u. So now I've also found my control function u. Um, p, the adjoint function, is 2 e to the minus rt x dot minus bx. That was what I had used up here. And so this is, um, well, 2a r1 plus r2 e to the r1 plus r2 minus little r t plus 2b r1 minus r2 e to the r1 minus r2 minus lowercase r t. Okay. Ah. That was example number three. So let's make a short recap because before we look at a different way to solve the third example. So the third example again um, has the has the discount factor in it a negative exponential and this gives rise to a system of first order differential equations where the coefficients are time dependent. This is a complication we have not considered in the first two examples. And we transform the system into a scalar differential equation of second order for x solve and with the solution find the corresponding optimal control function u. So the structure that now emerged through this sequence of three examples was one, trivial system where there's no mutual dependence of the state and the adjoint. So we can just treat it as two separate differential equations. <laughs> the second one really is just an integration exercise. The first one actually also. Um, the second example, here we had a non-trivial That was minus a non-trivial system. So here we solved with the help of the eigenvalue problem after we had transformed this inhomogeneous system to a homogeneous system uh, by calculating the steady state values and looking at the, at the distances uh, of the state and the adjoint from the steady state values. And then in three, we had, thankfully, a homogeneous problem, but with, not minus, yeah, minus, with, minus.
minus no not minus sorry plus this um 2a e to the minus rt minus b with time dependent entries in the coefficient matrix uh, which then required uh, that we um, that we switch to a second order differential equation for x well okay so three alternative this is where and and again my hope is that that if you are uh, faced with a problem that you need to solve that you can by uh, looking at the first order conditions from the maximum principle that you can distill what kind of system of differential equations for the state and the adjoint you're looking at and then accordingly engage the right solution theory for uh, systems of uh, first order equations if, if uh, you are ending up in this case you simply need to integrate if you're ending up in this case you may have to first transform um, to a homogeneous equation and then uh, employ the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors you can of course also transform here to second order equations if you prefer that and then and then do the characteristic polynomial the characteristic polynomial is exactly that of of the uh, of the eigenvalue problem here too um, or the, uh, you may have to to work with the uh, with these discount factors um, you may have encountered the current value Hamiltonian the current value Hamiltonian is precisely a vehicle to to avoid this so I'm going to quickly show this uh, because because if you employ the current value Hamiltonian instead of the standard Hamiltonian you're going to precisely get rid of this time varying coefficients here so how does that work um, so this is the current value Hamiltonian. So instead of writing H as, uh, what was it in our case? It was um, minus AX squared minus U squared E to the minus RT plus B, P, excuse me, BX plus U. Uh, in this approach, you specify what is called a current value Hamiltonian, which is simply defined as h times e to the rt, which then is going to uh, eliminate this e to the rt factor, but it adds it here. But what you now do is you say, well, this is my new um, adjoint function q, which is simply p times e to the rt if that's true then q dot is p dot e to the rt plus product rule uh, p r e to the rt now um, p e to the rt is q so i can write this as p e to the rt plus r times q so i can write q dot minus r q is p dot e to the r t now a second condition in the maximum principle is that this is the negative derivative of the standard hamiltonian with respect to x then i have the e to the r t factor on it and this gives me that this is the negative derivative of the current value hamiltonian with respect to x so this here becomes my new um, second condition in the maximum principle so then I take the partial derivative of the current value Hamiltonian with respect to u because e to the rt does not depend on u. So whatever maximizes h with respect to u or is critical uh, for h with respect to u is going to be critical for hc with respect to u. So this is then with respect to u is minus 2 u um, plus q equal to zero from which we get that u is q half 
So in the, uh, in the first approach, we saw that u is p to the p times e to the rt half, and, and, and that's, of course, precisely what's standing here now with the new notation q. q dot minus r q is a negative derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to x. So this is minus minus 2ax plus qb, which is 2ax minus q. Then I can write my system of equations, or I can just collect rather the differential equations first. So q is now 2ax um, plus r minus uh, b times q, and x dot is bx plus u is bx plus 1 half q. And you recognize right away the time-dependent coefficients are gone. I can collect x and q in a vector for the system of differential equations. I get b 1 half 2a r minus b times the vector xq. Right? Now, I can look at the... So this I can solve uh, as I did in the second example, so this is, is, it is already a homogeneous system. I do not need to transform first to a homogeneous system. I have it in homogeneous form. All I need to find are the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. So I find, you can convince yourself that this is uh, correct, I find the first eigenvector, eigenvalue, excuse me, is r, r half plus square root of r square divided by four minus rb minus a minus b square and this of course we recognize precisely from before these are our r1 plus r2 um, the first eigenvector now a new eigenvector is 1 and 2 times lambda 1 no this is not lambda 1 so this is not actually right um, uh, yeah, I can actually because I call them now lambda one because that's what we do with eigenvalues, right? So, so yeah, why not? So this is lambda one uh, minus b and uh, lambda two is r half minus r square four minus r b minus a minus b square is r one minus r two from our example uh, or the, from the first approach to this example and the corresponding eigenvector is 1 and 2 lambda 2 minus b yeah and then you can collect your solutions x and q in the way you do a times v1 e to the lambda 1 t and can I call this capital A this time I think I still can. But again, <laughs> I mean just constants that I'm going to adjust to initial conditions for x and the terminal condition for q, which of course I also inherit. So if p in capital T is equal to 0, then q in capital T also needs to be equal to 0. Plus b, same story, b2 e to the lambda 2 t, which I can write out a e to the lambda 1 t plus b e to the lambda 2 t for x and q as 2 a lambda 1 minus b which is r1 plus r2 uh, minus b times e to the lambda 1 t plus 2 b lambda 2 minus b e to the lambda 2 and that we recognize, so of course, uh, not surprisingly, as precisely the same solution that we got in the first approach here. This was uh, what, what I've now called lambda 1, lambda 2, here, right? This 
saying it. So there we go. You see that this is uh, uh, the, the, the point of the current value Hamiltonian is precisely to uh, circumnavigate the time dependent coefficients here in this matrix. Um, so that's just a trick in some sense. Um, and it's not not telling you anything more about about the structure. So for that, I in, in order to, to uh, finish this video here, uh, I come back to uh, this uh, these these three systems here of increasing um, in, increasing involvement, uh, but but it's always the same, right? You always end up with some system of differential equations first order for your state and for your adjoint, and then the 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 designer of your problem. You're likely facing this in some in some educational context. Um, if you if you're facing this in a, in a real world context, of course, the real world can throw anything at you. Uh, it can also easily easily throw nonlinear uh, equations at you that you cannot nicely write in this way. Right? It's easily now all you need to do is um, go into your differential equation for x here and put a put in put in x to the power of t or, or, or some, some, some other nonlinear beast in there and you're completely outside of the realm of, of, of what we're doing here because you end up with a nonlinear system of equations. Um, this is also a, a, a good point to, to make the connection to the, uh, to the Lagrange problem again. Right? Remember that in the, in the Lagrange problem or also in that video I'm talking about that you always end up with the system of equations for the variables that are involved if you solve the first order conditions there by, by taking the derivatives of the Lagrange with respect to the variables and then uh, with respect to the Lagrange multipliers. Uh, this is, this is this, it, it, it very much reflected here, the same structure. You end up with a system of equations and, this, and the, com the, the complexity or the, the complicatedness of the system of equations depends on your setup. So again, if you if you're if you're facing this in an educational context, the designer of your problem will have chosen one of those uh, one of those complexities for you to solve, and and I hope that this video helps you to see a bit more structure and a bit more forest for the trees. So with that, I'm going to close it because it's been long enough. Thanks for watching.